Okay, welcome to our class, uh, Jesus the God Man. We're in lesson number 12, and if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, let's open those up to John chapter five, and um, we will, uh, we'll be studying that particular section. Last time I explained the cyclical nature of this book, if you remember correctly. The big cycle or the big circle, if you wish, big wheel was Jesus that was uh, Jesus demonstrating his God-man nature and people responding to him in belief and disbelief. That's kind of our main theme, that, that idea keeps going round and round. Jesus showing that he is both God and man, people either responding with faith or disbelief. And then I, I said there was a smaller cycle within the cycle going on over and over again. And those were the, the ways that Jesus' divinity was being revealed, either through a witness, somebody saying that about Him, or Him saying that about Himself. His teaching uh, also was a witness of His uh, divinity, and of course His miracles were a witness of His divinity. So you know, you're, you're, you're reading this book and you're looking at it, and those two wheels, if you wish, are, are always going round and round. Okay, the faith, disbelief wheel, and then the witness wheel uh, within it. So today's lesson, we're going to see these cycles turning within each other again in chapter five. Let's read uh, chapter five, beginning in verse one. It says, after these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem, uh, by, the, by, the gate pool, uh, by the gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, Having five porticos, in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in, was made well from whatever disease with which he was afflicted. And so uh, after the miracle in Galilee, uh, in the Galilee region, Jesus returns once again to Jerusalem. He's going back and forth, if you notice, north, south, north, south, all the time, um, and has his first meeting with the opponents who will eventually have him killed. Now, a little bit of uh, geographical information. Jerusalem is surrounded by walls and entrances into the city, uh, which are called gates. And near one of these gates was a pool surrounded by porches. Uh, Bethsaida uh, means uh, in English uh, house of mercy. That's why you have the many, uh, many uh, hospitals that, that kind of use this term. Um, this was a gathering place uh, for the sick and the lame. Uh, there were pools or water uh, reservoirs, not only for that, but also for washing and for drinking. So that gives you an idea of the, um, you know, the, the geography, the layout of the temple and where that pool was. Um, in chapter five, beginning in uh, verse five, it says, um, a man was there who had been ill for uh, 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now I want you to notice one thing here. This man had no faith in Jesus. You know, modern day faith healers, if it doesn't work, they say, well, you just, you just didn't have enough faith. But notice this, he didn't even know who Jesus was. He had no faith in Jesus. The miracle is performed as mercy, but also as a demonstration of power and as a sign to those who were present. It wasn't kind of a psycho, you know, psychological thing. Here's a man, no, no faith in Jesus, no hope. No way his mind could play tricks on him. Jesus simply healed him at his word. So the objective was less about healing and more about how people would respond. Again, belief and disbelief. And John is going to describe the conflict that results from this miracle. So we read verse 9b, it says, and this is the key here to this whole passage. Now it was 
um, the Sabbath on that day. That'll be the point that causes all the, the trouble. So the day that Jesus performs this miracle was the Sabbath, comes from Genesis chapter two, verses one to three. The word Sabbath means to rest or to cease. Uh, so day number seven in the calendar, if you wish, was Saturday. For Jews, Saturday was the Sabbath day. Now, in Genesis, God ceases from His cycle of creation and work, and He provides a divine example of rest or cessation of work. You know, if He didn't do this, human beings would work themselves to death. If He didn't do this, our, our, our intention is to one more day, one more work, you know, masters would uh, enforce their slaves. Uh, those of us who are motivated, eight types would work you know, seven days a week without stop. And so God you know, inserts into the natural scheme of life a day where we stop uh, working. Now in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, God describes how the day is to be used and not used. Now a lot of festivals were celebrated to praise God's mercy and greatness and they culminated on the Sabbath day, for example in Exodus chapter 34 verse 22. With the construction of the temple and later on the establishment of synagogues in different cities, the Sabbath became associated with activities at the temple or in the synagogues, if you ever wondered how that worked. At the very beginning, there was no meeting, they didn't go anywhere. You know, when, when God established the Sabbath, it was not associated with going to a place to worship. It was simply, you cease from work, you, you, know, you, you commune with God, you, you rest from physical activity and perhaps give yourself over to the resting of your body and your soul. But eventually the Sabbath came to mean no work and meeting at the temple or meeting at the synagogue for prayer and teaching and other forms of worship. What I'm saying is that when God commanded this, it didn't begin with formal worship. That, that evolved over time with the Jews. Interesting thing about the Sabbath also was that it was particular to the Jewish religion. No other religion had that idea of a day of rest. And so the Jews were different, very different from the pagan tribes around them in many different ways, but this was a significant way that they were different. They had a one day a week where no one did uh, any work. Well, in the fourth century before Christ, the rabbis or the teachers began defining what the idea of work was, and their definitions became burdensome. They became ridiculous. And so something that begins very simple, very simply, take one day and get physical rest, evolves into you rest on that day, but also you become involved in activities at the synagogue or at the temple. And then it evolves from there to religious leaders beginning to define what is work and what is not work. And so eventually they prohibited 38 or 39 types of work. For example, you couldn't walk more than one mile from your home or else it was considered work. Things like that, you see. Or um, a scribe, you know, someone whose task was to copy manuscripts and so on and so forth. A scribe uh, could not carry his pens on the Sabbath because well, the rabbis considered <coughs> that being work. And so you know, uh, it went from something simple to something very heavy to bear uh, legalistic uh, and actually uh, ridiculous. And so keep that in mind, okay, when we read this passage where the Pharisees are taking exception to the fact that Jesus uh, uh, did a miracle or did a healing on the Sabbath. Uh, in verse 10 it says, so the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, is it the Sabbath? And it is not, uh, it is the Sabbath rather, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. I think this explains why the Jews, especially the Pharisees, were saying to the man that he was sinning because carrying his pallet on the Sabbath was considered work. <laughs> I mean, that's how ridiculous this had become. They, you know, we smile and we go, wow, but they were, they were serious. Note that they completely dismissed the miracle. 
completely dismiss the man's joy and freedom, completely dismiss the opportunity to give God glory. All they want is that their concept of what is right be obeyed. And, and they were blind, to the, re, uh, blind to, the, uh, to the rest. So let's keep going, verse 11. But he answered them, um, this is the, uh, the, the person who was uh, handicapped, who couldn't walk. He says, but he answered them, uh, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. Of course, as far as the healed man is concerned, the only authority that counts for him is the power of the person who healed me. You know, he's saying, hey, don't talk to me. Don't get on me. Talk to the guy who healed me. If you're going to blame somebody for something. And so in verse 12 and 13, we keep going. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. So the same idea, remember I said, he did, never mind he had no faith, he didn't even know who Jesus was. So the miracle, of course, demonstrated God's power. In verse 14 and 15, it says, Afterward Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. And so Jesus, Jesus dealt with the poor physical health by healing the lame man. Now he deals with his spiritual health, his spiritual well-being uh, as well. He says, sin no more. Sin no more carries with it the implication that sins are forgiven. You can't say sin no more unless, first of all, you, you forgive the person. You know, I forgive you and now go and sin no more. So he warns them to stay away from sin, seeing um, uh, what it has caused in the past. Perhaps some, some excess or some sinful behavior in his life has caused him to uh, be healed and, and perhaps led to you know, the destruction of his, uh, of his health. And so he says, you know, sin no more. Never mind you don't want to be physically ill, sin no more because you'll avoid uh, the, uh, the punishment in hell. And so the healing and the witness and the teaching bring forth faith as well as a new life. So the man who was ravaged by illness and burdened by sin is freed from both uh, and becomes productive. How does he become productive? He goes back to the Jews and he says, oh, I'll tell you now who healed me. Jesus healed. Now he knows who it is that healed him. And so in this man begins the work of faith. And the first thing that faith wants to do is share the good things that Jesus has done for him. As a matter of fact, a lot of times you know, young, young Christians say, well, I can't teach or I have nothing to offer or I can't, but the, 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 the most powerful thing you can do many times is to give your witness of how you became a Christian because other people can relate to that experience. You know what I'm saying? All right, so we see the man made well and producing a powerful witness on behalf of Jesus. This not only brings Jesus more contacts, if you wish, more followers, but it also provides ammunition for his attackers. So let's get back to the text. It says, for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Now, the most obvious of their accusations is the one they leveled against the lame man. They accused Jesus of working on the Sabbath and therefore defiling, or dis, uh, defiling the day and disobeying God. So watch Jesus' response. Jesus says, but he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself uh, am working. And so the Lord responds that if they are charging him with this, well, they're also accusing God because you know, even God is working on this day. And his reasoning, Jesus' reasoning for this answer goes like this. God never stops working or doing good. And what I have done is a manifestation of God's work on behalf of this man. And then 
if what I have done breaks God's law, then you are accusing God of breaking His own law because in reality, He's the one that's done that. Who healed this man? God has healed him. So if you're accusing me of work, then you're accusing him of work and you're accusing him of disobeying his own command, which is impossible. And so in verse 18, here's the witness. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. You know, some people say, ah, where is it in the Bible that God says he is God? Well, right here. Because he says, my father is working, I am working. How do we know that he was, you know, that was what he was trying to do? Because that's what the Jews who were accusing him understood him to say. Even his enemies understood that he was claiming that he was the Son of God, that he was divine. Except when we look at their, you know, when we look at it through their eyes, they understand what he's claiming, they just don't believe it. There, there's the disbelief part, okay? Um, verse 18, we did. Okay, so the leaders are frustrated and angry as well as recognizing that Jesus is claiming a very special uh, relationship and equality with God. And so in their frustration and anger, they launch an attack on Jesus. And in the next section, Jesus responds to them by warning them of the various ways that they are in danger of losing their souls. Actually, the, the, the lesson title for this particular lesson is Six Ways to Lose Your Soul. And we see six ways to lose one's soul represented by the um, Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. And so, uh, they are in danger of losing their souls because, first of all, of disrespect. It says, therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of Himself unless it is something He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all things that He Himself is doing. And the Father will show Him greater works than these so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but He has given all judgment to, his, or to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. And so they denounced Him for doing the very thing His divine nature was sent to do. They accused the sinless one of sin, the very thing that would eventually crucify him. So Jesus came to cleanse the world of sin, not to add to sins, he came to take away sins, not to add more sin. And so Jesus tells them that those who say they honor him but end up accusing him of sin don't really honor him. In fact, they are guilty of disrespect. You know, I said six ways to lose your, sin, uh, lose your soul. One way is disrespect. Disrespect of God and disrespect of the one that God sent. So you know, when, you, when you're watching a movie where the screenwriter has purposely put a curse word into the screenplay uh, using the Lord's name, that, that's not by accident. The actors are not you know, thinking, I think I'll use, you know, I'll say JC here when I'm angry. That's the screenwriter, he's put that in. The actors only, you know, they just repeat what's in the script. Now they're guilty of disrespecting God Himself. One of the ways you lose your soul. And so uh, to dishonor God, the word honor means to place a value on something. We are in danger of losing our souls if we do not place the proper value or honor on Jesus. So if someone says, oh Jesus, oh yeah, yeah oh, I think he's a great teacher. They dishonor him simply by calling him a great teacher because he's much more than a great teacher. Uh, value his person um, through worship. Value his word through study and obedience. Value his work on the cross by proclaiming the good news. So many will lose their souls because they did not respect Christ. They did not honor him as he should be honored. Number two, to uh, lose your soul, being unprepared. Verses 24 to 30, let's read that. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me 
has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. I mean, is it any clearer there that there's only one Messiah, one Redeemer, one way to be saved? Can He say it more clear? These people that you hear, there's nothing in the Bible, Jesus doesn't judge, obviously have not read the book of John. Verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live again. What man could make such a claim? And yet Jesus is saying, you know, the hour is coming when those who hear the voice of the one who is speaking these words, the dead will rise. Another way that He's proclaiming His divinity. Again, people who say, well, it doesn't say, it. Jesus never said that He was divine. Really? For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself. And He gave Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. Again, People say, well, Jesus didn't judge, so you shouldn't judge. Really? Have you read John? Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment, uh, my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. So here Jesus is speaking of the judgment that they are leveling against Him, and He continues by saying, in effect, speaking of judgment, anyone who listens to me will not be judged, but will be saved. So the people who are judging Him, this is how He answers them. You're judging me? You know, if in modern parlance, he's saying, you're judging me? Wait, wait till the real judgment comes. You're going to find out who's doing the judging here. So, uh, 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 so he says, you know, in other words, where does this leave you people who are accusing me? If I'm the judge, if I judge according to God, if God has given me the power to judge, the power to raise the dead, where does that leave you people who are judging me, judging the judge. Imagine in a court of law, human court of law, if one of the lawyers stands up and says, you know what, you're doing a lousy job, I don't think you're qualified to be a judge, I don't even think you are a judge, did you even go to school to be a judge? You know? What happens to that lawyer? <laughs> He's in jail. <laughs> He's in jail. So imagine if you do that to the divine judge. So he says that they're going to see the day when he will arise and they will see the day when all, including them, will be judged by God through him. So what does it mean? It means that he will judge them. It means that they have been wrongly accusing their own judge. So we can lose our souls when we fail to realize that Jesus is not only our Savior, but he'll also be our judge as well. So how, how to lose your soul? Disrespect. You can lose it by being unprepared for judgment. Number three, how do you lose your soul? Disrespect, unprepared, stubbornness. Stubbornness. Let's read. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the, his, that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John. And he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, He has testified of me. You have neither heard His voice at any time nor seen His form. You do not have His word abiding in you, for you do not believe Him who He has sent. So Jesus reviews with them their incredible stubbornness and hard-heartedness. He says, you believe people who gladly boast about themselves, your earthly leaders. You believe John, the prophet, that the time was near. But you refuse to believe me, whose message is greater than the message of John the Baptist and whose miracles are irrefutable. So 
He says to them, you refuse to listen to God because you don't like the message and you will not permit the message to come into your hearts. Now the implication of course is that your hard-hearted disbelief in me demonstrates that you never really believed in Him either. You know, Jesus is saying, if you really believed God, then you'd believe me. But, but not believing me and not believing in me is simply a demonstration that you never really believed in God anyways. Every time we resist the word, every time we resist the impulse to do better, every time we resist to try to live or serve better, our heart becomes a little bit harder every time, every time. That's what had happened to them. So a hard and stubborn heart allows us to sin with little guilt or afterthought. If you can sin and not have any twinge of conscience, you better be careful because your heart is getting pretty hard. So when we, re, when we arrive at this point, we're in danger of losing our soul because like these Jews, we've become hardened through stubbornness. We refuse to obey the things that God has given us. And so that's one way to lose our, lose our soul, to become more and more stubborn in our spiritual lives. Number four, ignorance, 39 and 40. Uh, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have eternal life. So Jesus rebukes them for being ones who had the privilege of knowing the scriptures, being so-called expert in the scriptures, but they missed the point of the whole uh, thing. They taught that the scriptures led one to eternal life. The scriptures also lead to Jesus who gives eternal life. They never made the connection. They had their own interpretation of what the scriptures said and they stuck with it. Even, even when Jesus came and reinterpreted the scriptures for them and then did miracles to prove that his interpretation was correct, even then they refused, uh, uh, even then they refused to believe. You know, we shouldn't be too quick to condemn these men because we also miss the connection at times, don't we? We're sometimes so busy planning Bible studies, organizing the worship and activities that we forget that the purpose of it all is to grow in the knowledge and the likeness of, of Christ. I, I, I'm disappointed when I see brethren arguing. Imagine members of the same congregation arguing and fighting and not talking to each other because they're mad and so on and so forth, and yet remain faithful to all the assemblies. I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, that guy who comes Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and he's mad at brother over here and he just avoids that brother. Are you going to tell me he's going to hear, he's going to hear 150 sermons this year and not a thing is going to connect with him that the problem is between him and his brother? You know, when, when, when we make, quote, religion our goal, when we act like fleshly people in order to advance our religious goals, or we devour each other so we can set church policy, we have so missed the point of Christianity. <laughs> We have so missed the point of Christianity. You know, a lot of people who know a lot about the Bible will lose their souls because they're ignorant about Jesus Christ, the main topic of the Bible. So they were in danger of losing their souls because of stubbornness. Number five, uh, ignorance, excuse me, ignorance. Not just ignorance of what it said, ignorance of how it applies to them in their lives. You have to internalize the word, and the way you internalize the word is through obedience. Then it becomes alive in you. It has that effect on you. All right, number five, we've got to move here. Um, pride. That, I mean, pride could be number one, but it's just in the story here, you know, in the narrative of what's go going on between Jesus and the, uh, the Jews. Pride is Number five, uh, verse 41 to 44, let's read those. It says, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? And so this one must have hurt them a lot. He said, remember now, he's not making a discourse to his apostles about how to you know, treat Jewish leaders. He's, 
he's speaking directly to his accusers, face to face. This is a dialogue between the two of them. And so he says to them, you're ready, you're ready to give honor to kings, soldiers, your own teachers, but you refuse to honor me because I don't honor you. And I don't honor you because I reveal your sins. That's why you're mad at me. And the reason they didn't honor him was because they were angry with him. They were angry with him because he didn't approve of them and this was something that their pride craved. You know, a lot of people lose their souls because they would rather have the approval of the world, their family and friends, than the approval that comes from God through obedience in Christ Jesus. All right, number six, plain old disbelief. Six ways to lose your soul. Disrespect, unpreparedness, stubbornness, ignorance, pride, disbelief. Verse 45, do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus tells them that he doesn't need to accuse them, he will only have to judge them. There's no need for him to accuse because their own words will accuse them. They say that they believe God's word in Moses. But God's word in Moses tells all readers that they should believe in Christ Jesus. They should be looking for Him. By disbelieving Christ, they, dis they demonstrate that they don't really believe in the word that Moses gave them originally. What they believe and depend on is the interpretation of Moses that they had accumulated over the, over the centuries. They stood condemned because their actions, you know, disbelief and rejection of Jesus, demonstrated their true disbelief of God's word. You know, very interesting, I, I once took a class at, at college on Judaism and um, it was in Montreal, it was a graduate class and it was taught by a, a, Jewish, um, a Jewish person, a Jewish professor, rabbi, and um, uh, and I thought this is going to be interesting you know, to, to hear from the Jewish perspective you know, about being a Jew and so on and so forth. You know? And in the very first class, the professor said, if I was stuck on an island and I, you know, and I could keep only one book, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, for sure. You know, he's going to say, well, I would keep the scriptures. When a Jew says the scriptures, they mean the Old Testament. You know? um, I would keep the scriptures, but no, he said, I would keep the Mishnah. <laughs> I would keep the commentary on the scriptures, not the scriptures themselves, because he said that they would be much, much more full, much more revealing, uh, much, a lot more information, a lot, you know. Imagine, it's like, it's like a Christian saying, if I was stuck on an island and I only had one book to keep with me, I would keep uh, Joe, Joe Brown's commentary on the book of Matthew. <laughs> You'd say, really, if you only had one book? Wouldn't you rather keep just Matthew? And the, the point that, that it brought home to me was when I read in the Bible that Jesus accuses the Jewish leaders, you, you read Moses and you don't, you don't even believe what Moses said. You would prefer believing the commentary that you people have created about what Moses said rather than the actual word itself. That's nothing new. <laughs> that still happens, still happens today. So a lot of people you know, have a Bible or they know about the Bible, they even hear lessons out, out of the Bible on a regular basis, but saving faith requires two basic responses to the Bible. One, believing as true what God says in His Word, and then obeying God's Word. Uh, Jesus says it in Mark 16, you know, he who has believed, there's the belief part, and has been baptized, there's the obedience part, shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be con uh, condemned. So some people are in the danger of losing their soul because they know and they understand what the Bible says, but their disobedience to the word shows that they don't really, really believe it. All right, so let's summarize here. The Jewish leaders judged and accused Jesus of sin. And Jesus replied that God had made him to be judge of all men and that his witness and his teachings and his miracles, those are the proof that what he says is true. 
And so he demonstrates his power as judge by listing the reasons of their condemnation. Disrespect for God by refusing to honor the Son of God. Being unprepared for their own judgment. Uh, refusal to submit to God's word. Ignorance of God's true will and purpose for their lives, which, is, which begins with faith in Christ. Uh, a prideful love of this world and disbelief of the word and manifestation of the word in Christ Jesus. And so this rebuke might give a person pause to think about things, but not these guys. This just made them angrier and even more resolute to destroy him. And our next lesson will we'll kind of pick up on that and see how they respond to what he has just, uh, what he has just said to them. All right, we'll uh, quit right here. I think our time is up and uh, we'll, continue, we'll continue this, uh, this lesson uh, next time we meet.